Two years? Has it really been that long? Ron Stoppable fought as he gazed out into the stars from his bedroom window with Rufus snoozing beside it. It seemed like honestly almost yesterday that Kim had saved Kim, Ron had saved Kim Possible from the Louderan warriors, a monarch god, a warhawk, and, and thwarted towards Lordian invasion, and fully mastered his mystical monkey powers, to which it only allowed him to successfully defeat Warhawk and Warmonga, of course, and he did help from both Kim and surprisingly Drew Lipsky, Dr. Draken, and Shigo. While those two had always had been enemies of Kim Possible and Ron for several years, they put aside their differences and worked together to defeat the Lordorian invaders. After the invasion was thwarted, Shigo and Drakton had been hailed as heroes by the entire world and were eventually pardoned by Global Justice, who promised to clear their criminal records and pardon them for their crimes as long as they swore never to resume villain work. Draken and Shigo agreed to this and underwent a year of rehabilitation by Global Justice, and eventually the two ex-villains managed to reform themselves once the year had ended. Shigo ended up becoming a teacher at Kim and Ron's old school, and Dr. Draken eventually landed himself as a professor at Middleton College. At one point before becoming a teacher, Shigo was contacted by her brothers at Team Go HQ, who asked if she returned with them, to which of course Shigo declined. She never really got along with her brothers that much, and which had played her a part of her originally leaving Team Go to begin with. As for Dr. Draken, he finally accepted that no matter how hard he tried to defeat Kim Possible and rule the world, he just couldn't win no matter what villainous scheme he and Shigo cooked up. Kim and Ron had always managed to find some way to stop him and Shigo, and Draken had just begun to tire of it all. It wasn't until the Lordurians invaded Earth that Dr. Draken and Shigo finally accepted this and decided to give it up once in her work and Ramorga had been defeated. Kim and Ron originally had fought the two of them would end up in prison for good due to their long history of villainy. But since Dr. Draken and Shigo had assisted the heroes in saving Earth from the Lordurian invasion, two of them were offered a chance of rehabilitation. They both accepted this and without any trouble. As for Kim and Ron, the two of them had seemed to decide to officially join Global Justice as local agents, while they're still helping others around the world like they always had. It had taken the entire world a while to recover from the Lordian invasion, as many of the major cities had suffered heavy damage, and unmanned alien war machines, as well as casualties. Many of the governments across the globe had constantly feared the Lordorians possibly returning with a larger invasion fleet. So they had taken a lot of steps to ensure that the Earth was more prepared and much stronger in military power. Many of the Lordorian war machines left behind after an invasion that had been collected by various government and military agencies all over the globe in order to study the advanced technology and possibly even the reverse engineer of some of it to give to Earth in a huge boost of military strength, as well as recreation and entertainment. All this advanced technology was kept locked away in a secret government bases just a very few know about. The only agencies that had access to or knowledge the bases were Global Justice, CIA, and the U.S. government. Since Kim and Ron were now members of Global Justice, they were also one of the few people that knew about the bases, along with their location. However, there were many so other criminal organizations in the world that they attempt to get their hands on this technology as well as where Global Justice came in. For the last two years, Global Justice had been working for around the clock to ensure no one in this advanced alien technology fell into the hands of criminals. Some of Kim's old rivals, such as Professor Dementor, Senior Senior, Duff Killigan and Gemini had tried multiple times to get their hands on the Lordrigan technology. However, Global Justice and Team Possible always managed to foil their plans. Gemini had been a bigger problem, however, since his criminal organization had made multiple attempts to break into these secret bases with the help of his agents. He had even recruited a bunch of Monkey Fist's old ninja cormorants to assist the organization in some heists but they also didn't help much. 
Kim and Ron also didn't hesitate to take down, and after a few more failed attempts, Gemini gave up after figuring out the Lordran technology wasn't worth the trouble stealing if he and his agents got away caught. And after a few more attempts, attempts at failing, Gemini gave up of figuring out the Lordan technology wasn't worth trouble stealing if he and his agents got caught. As Ron had pounded his thoughts, Rufus stirred uncomfortably in his sleep and began whimpering and muttering something unintelligible. Ron tried to make out what the small rodent was saying, but he wasn't sure since Rufus was pretty much just mumbling under his breath. Once Rufus started screaming, Ron shook him awake. Rufus, you okay? What's wrong, buddy? Ron asked worriedly as Rufus woke up. The small pig rodent shot up from his tiny bed, panting and sweating as what looked like fear. It was clear that Rufus had a nightmare, and judging by the way he was acting, Ron had a feeling it must have been a bad one. Rufus glared up at Ron with the look of fear in his face. Ron noticed something odd, though. The fear in Rufus's eyes seemed to be directed towards Ron, as this unsettled him. Then why did Rufus seem so afraid of Ron? This wasn't like him at all. Rufus, what are you looking at me like that? What's wrong? Ron asked. Dead. All dead, Rufus said in a frightened voice. Dead? Who's dead? Ron asked in confusion, not having any clue as to what Rufus meant. Kim's dead. Other's dead, Rufus replied. That response made Ron uneasy. It was clear at this point that whatever nightmare Rufus had, it must have really frightened him and upset him. He, Kim, had suffered from horrible fate than this nightmare. Then who else was the others that Rufus was referring to? A lot that didn't seem much more sense to Ron. Others? Rufus, you're not making any sense, Ron said. Rufus made strange gestures, imitating the weird firecracker sound in the process. Ron felt a little uneasy by this, but he came to the conclusion that Rufus only had a bad dream, nothing more. Actually, don't worry about it too much. You just had a nightmare, so let's not try and worry about it too much. I'm sure Kim is doing fine, Ron assured. The small roaned with a smile. Rufus then nodded and sat back down on his bed, a feeling a bit calmer now. As this small mole rat fell asleep, Ron couldn't help but wonder what Rufus meant by saying that Kim and the others were dead. Of course, Ron knew it. It was just only a nightmare, but he still felt uneasy by it. The thought of losing Kim was something that Ron feared the most. As for what Rufus meant by the others being dead, Ron wasn't so sure what he meant. Was Rufus referring to Ron's family or possibly Kim's family? It didn't matter that much. Ron passed it off as a nightmare and let it slide. Feeling a bit tired himself, he got into bed and then soon dozed off. Once Ron was fully asleep, he began to dream. In Ron's dream, he, both him and Kim were dancing alongside the huge field of poppy flowers lit up by the moonlight in the nighttime sky. Kim was dressed up in a beautiful white sleeveless dress robe resembling that of Roman goddess dress. Ron was still wearing his night clothes on in his dream as he and Kim danced along the flowers and hearts of joy and love. And with their orange hair and their white dress blowing off in the soft night air, along with her green eyes sparkling in the moonlight, Kim was truly beautiful. Ron's heart had pounded with excitement as she embraced him and they began kissing under the moonlight of the full moon. The two then began again making love in the fields of flowers, but shortly afterwards, Ron's dreams slowly began to change, and not in a good way. The moonlight then soon changed from its radiant white glow to a chilling blood red, and the flowers transformed into sharp, thorny brambles. Ron and Kim ended up being scratched and cut by the brambles, but what was even worse is that the fire suddenly broke out in the distance, followed by a psychotic laugh at the sound that almost sounded like a joker's laugh. Kim and Ron didn't know where it came from, but they were now fearing for their lives as the fire began to gain on them. The two lovers began running through the brambles, ignoring their plain and bare feet and legs taken from the thorns, but the fire eventually blazed right in front of them and soon surround them. As in the large of the fire began to get close in on Kim and Ron, someone began walking towards them through the flames, features obstructed by the smoke and fire. Whoever this person was, Kim and Ron couldn't make out. Who they were was all too much with the smoke and their fire masking the view. However, once the unknown figure got close enough, Kim was suddenly engulfed by the flags and was burned alive. 
Her screams echoed throughout the whole burning field as the figure into the smoke began cackling and sneer against Glee against Kim's horrible death. Ron screamed in both grief and horror as he rushed towards Kim, but before he got close enough to her, he too ended up being engulfed by a fire and being burnt alive. Once this happened, Ron woke up in cold sweat, panting in both fear and shock. No! he gasped, looking around frantically. Rufus was still asleep at his clock read 3.30 p.m. Sigh in relief, Ron made back to bed, pondering about the horrible nightmare he had just experienced. Ron had never had like this before. Granted, he had his own fair share of nightmares similar to his past, like the one where he dreamed about Kim at the Sanford Drone in his old high school, and that it had really shaken up Ron to the point where he ended up calling Kim just to confirm that it only had been a nightmare. This was far different, however. The nightmare involved Ron and Kim both dying in a horrible fire, and there was just that strange figure in the flames had been laughing like a demon at their horrible fates. The figure had been too obstructed by the flames for Ron to get a good enough look at them. But whoever that figure was, it had definitely been a man since their laughter and sounded like a high-pitched man's voice. Ron thought about calling up Kim to let her know that he just experienced, but he quickly dismissed that thought, not wanting to wake her up in the middle of the night. It was just a nightmare, Ron muttered. No need to worry about it any further. As he fell back to sleep, he heard a familiar voice echo in his mind. Stoppable, son. Ron opened up his eyes a little bit, feeling a bit annoyed having his sleep interrupted. Wake me up later. Stoppable, son. Wake up, the male Asian voice commanded. It was a white glow that appeared at the door of Ron's room. Ron then turned around and saw a familiar astral form of Master Sensei standing over at the door to his room. Huh? Sensei? What are you doing here? Ron exclaimed in surprise, now fully awake. Stoppable son, hear me well, Sensei began. You and Kimberly San will face a new threat, unlike any other. I must warn you that this new threat will be far worse and more dangerous than a powerful than you've ever faced before. You will face many horrible trials and tributations, but the one you'll love is also going to face the same thing. If it all goes wrong, do not lose sight of who you are. Stay within the light at all times, or you will lose yourself to the darkness. My time of passing is drawing near, and the fate of many other fellow students as well. But do not fear with your well-being. Remember you are the master of mystical monkey powers, and you must remain strong um, no matter what you face. And with that being said, since I vanished from the room, bathing in the darkness once again, Ron's mind was going into order drive at this point. He had no idea what this new fret was, but whatever it was, Ron knew it couldn't be good. What concerned him was that Sensei said about his time passing drawing was near, and his other students' time drawing was near too. This made Ron nervous. Did Sensei foresee the deaths of his students and himself? And that was what the huge Fred he was referring to? Ron wondered. In his mind flashed back to his nightmare with him and Kim burning in the field. Then there was an evil laughter from an unknown figure in the middle of the flames. It seemed like too much of a coincidence. Was that a nightmare in Sensei's vision that somehow related? Ron didn't want to speculate too much, but he had mo almost a bad feeling growing in his gut, and it told him that the nightmare was probably more than just a nightmare. If what Sensei was saying was true, then it could have been possible that the nightmare was most likely a vision as well. I better tell Kim about this tomorrow, because if new Fred is upon us, we'll need to be prepared for it, Ron said softly. Then he glanced over at Rufus, who was still asleep. I won't let bad anything happen to the ones I love. I can't let that happen. Ron pondered everything that he just experienced while trying to fall back to sleep, but he had trouble doing so upon recalling that part Sensei had said to him about him and Kim facing a new fret like any other. What new fret could this be? Was it the Blauderans would possibly return to Earth for revenge for losing Warhawk and Ramonga at the hands of Ron? So many questions flooded Ron's mind, but he had no answers to any of them. Sensei had also mentioned this as a fret was more powerful and dangerous than anything he had ever faced before, so Ron was pretty sure the Blauderans wouldn't be it. 
they had faced the Lardorans before and defeated them, so Ron figured that this so-called new threat has to be something entirely new. He had no idea what it was. What is also worried Ron was what Sensei said, something about staying in the light if all went wrong. All goes wrong? What did Sensei say by that? Ron wondered, despite for the answers he didn't have. Whatever it meant, Ron would have to figure out in the morning. He also planned to tell Kim about it as well. This horrible nightmare, he was trying his best to put all of his worries aside. Ron slowly fell back to sleep. Meanwhile, at the back of the alleys of Lowerton, Professor Dementor and Duff Killigan were currently meeting up in a shady individual, accompanied by two henchmen. Dementor, Duff, and several other members of Henchco had successfully stolen over 6.2 kilograms of plutonium and plutonium processing plant from in India. The individual had promised Duff and Dementor a, a large amount of fortune for $3 million if he brought it over to them. A fearing facility wasn't easy, but with the help from Dean Amy, she had temporarily altered Dementor and Duff's appearance resemble security officers. Once inside, Dementor, Duff, and his assistants took out the unlimited number of guards' presents. Since it was late at night, then proceeded to steal over for several containers of plutonium. Afterwards, Professor Dementor had brought Duff and his assistants back to Middleton using a stolen chopper. Then they had transported the plutonium over to the back alley in a large truck to deliver it to the one hired them. This person wouldn't reveal their name when Duff and Dementor asked who they were. Instead, the two villains had their address as client as Agent R. Agent R wore a black cloak with a hood over his head to hide their facial features. But Duff and Dementor could tell by Agent R was a man due to the tone of his voice. Agent R's voice sounded similar to the Joker's voice, but with a slightly lower pitch than Joker's making him suspicious and sinister. Whoever this man was currently sounded like someone you wouldn't want to mess with. You're late, Agent R said, as Duff and Dementor approached him and the two henchmen at the alley entrance. I expected you to arrive ten minutes earlier. Eh, yeah, sorry about that, Duff Killigan apologized. Dean Amy took her sweet time changing us back to our normal forms. Those disguises she used on us took a little bit more time to undo. I see. Agent R said, replied calmly. Then he stepped out of the alleyway into the streetlights. The face upstroke that of him is cloak. I trust you that, I, that you have what I desire? Indeed we do, Professor Dementor said proudly. 6.2 kilograms of plutonium, all in this truck. Show me, Agent R ordered sternly. I want to see it for myself. No problem, laddie, Duff nodded. He then went over to the back of the truck slid open the truck rear doors. It's all there. Agent R walked over behind the truck with his two henchmen and gazed inside the truck when he noticed several metal drums of radioactive warning labels on them, all lined up on the inside of the truck. Agent R nodded to his henchmen, then ordered them to check the each drum to make sure they held tight of the right amount inside them. Once they were all thoroughly checked, Agent R's henchmen exited the truck and nodded. Checks right out there, boss. 6.2 kilograms, one of the henchmen reported. Good, Agent R replied, sounding rather pleased. Your efforts will be rewarded. I shall have my organization transport the plutonium to our hideout. When you two shall have your reward. Aye, I'm glad we could be of service, laddie, Duff Killigan said proudly. I might even ask, though, why do you need so much of this stuff? Plutonium's rather dangerous to be messing with. He does have a point now there, Professor Dementor agreed, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe 6.2 um, kilograms of plutonium is the same amount used in atomic bombs used in Japan, Japan several decades ago. You're quite right on that, Agent R replied. However, you will not need to concern yourselves for my reasons of needing this plutonium. Your work is done, and I will see it that you are both rewarded for it. And how much are you willing to pay us? Duff Killigan asked curiously. How about three million sound? Agent R asked. Duff and Dementor's eyes widened open. Three million? That'll be swell. Professor Dementor beamed happily. Hey, that sounds perfect, Duff agreed. Very well, Agent R replied. 
I shall transfer the reward money to your secure accounts. You will be notified on your cell phones once it's done. For now, I have provided you all with a small Corvette to make a clean getaway. Agent R then pulled over to the black Corvette that Stingray parked in the by over a red painted curb. Nice wheel, Professor Den Mentor grinned. Just the right car for a getaway, Duff Killigan added. The keys are behind the driver's side tire. Now go, Agent R instructed. It's been a pleasure doing business with you, Killigan winked. Then the two villains rushed over to the black sports car. Professor Dementor found the keys under the driver's side tire, like Agent R had said, then unlocked the doors. Duff took the passenger side, while Dementor took the driver's side. Shortly after the two buckled up, they sped off into the night. After a minute, once they were down a few blocks, Duff's phone began to ring and he answered it. And there's a message from Agent R. You two did better than I expected, so I'll be giving you both your reward, Agent R began. His tone took dark and sinister. Your internal award. Right after he said that unsettling line, the message ended with Duff instantly received a text from an unknown number. And when he opened it, he found a message that read, Look inside the glove box. This got Duff confused, but Dementor then heard something odd. Hey, what's that beeping sound inside the glove box? Dementor asked. Duff opened up the glove box and found out what it is, and to his horror, he found a large pipe bomb inside the glove box, which had a timer on it, which was down to two seconds. Duff and Dementor's eyes widened in pure terror, but before they could even react, the pipe bomb detonated, causing an entire car to explode in an enormous fireball that lit up several blocks. Back near the alleyway, Ancient R sneered cruelly under the hood cloak of his hood. He heard the explosion where he stood, letting him know that his deed was done. Duff and Dementor have received their call rewards. Was that necessary, boss? One of the henchmen asked, rather shocked. Oh, please, Agent R scoffed. No one will miss them. And besides, if they were to one day rule this planet, then there could only be one villain to rule it, and that is me. You've got a point there, boss, the other henchman agreed. Indeed, Agent R replied. Then turned to the truck loaded with the plutonium. Now we must leave before the police arrive. Three of them departed inside the truck and headed inside their hideout. Agent R sneered as he passed by the burning remains of the Corvette at the side of the road. Those two have outlived their usefulness and now my plan could full finally become a reality. The spoils of their labor, Agent R fought as he drove down the dimly lit road. But before my plan... For a full world domination, I can finally take root. I must eliminate any heroes and organizations that may try and stop me. I'll start with the two best and world's known heroes. Agent R then lift up his wrist, revealing a metal band around with several buttons on it. He pressed one of them, and a hollow projector of Kim Possible and Ron Stoppable appeared, just above the metal band. Yes, Kim Possible and her sweet boyfriend sidekick, Ron Stoppable. These two particularly insparable. But that will soon change, Agent R grinned. I'll crush your spirits into dust, and only then I can finally kill them. Ten minutes later, Agent R and his man arrived at their hideout far under the city of Middleton. Once inside, dozens of other workers began unloading the containers of plutonium as Agent R stepped out of his truck. I see you made it back safely, my lord, a large man in a black imperial-style suit greeted. Yes, Commander Aaron Faust. The plutonium's here, Agent R said. Those two I hired to bring it to me were quite useful, but they have been disposed to ensure we, Black Shadow, stand for above all other villains. Indeed, Faust replied. We are only fit one day to rule this world, and I believe you will lead all of us to victory once the time is right. Lord Ridley Farkas, Agent R, formerly known as Ridley, lowered his hood down, exposing his features. His appearance was rather intimidating. He had a green eyes that looked similar to Kim Possible's, only they were much more sinister gaze than Kim's. His hair was dark greenish, black, and short. Ridley also had a long scar at the side of his face, with two smaller ones on his chin. His face had resembled the other face of fictional character known as Jeff the Killer, making him more look frightening and sadistic. Ridley's appearance was truly imitating, and evil, and it was 
almost enough to make anyone strike into fear into the hearts of anyone who dared to go stand against him. As for Ridley's grin, it was creepy enough to even make a grown man tremble in fear. In addition to Ridley's evil and frightening appearance, he had also had a very nasty temper that tended to become easily angered if things didn't go exactly his way or if someone had attempted to betray him. Those stupid enough to betray Ridley, however, did not live long enough to tell the tale. There have been instances where some members of the Black Shadow organization tried to betray Ridley, but easily dealt with them by hunting them down and killing them without any remorse. It was the first time he had killed, and certainly won't be the last. Ridley longed to bring the order to the world. His order, he'd crush anyone who stood in his way to world domination. Ridley's second command, named Aaron Faust, didn't look as sinister as Ridley, but he did have sound cruel and unscrumptious as Ridley was. He wore an eye patch on his right eye, however, due to an injury he had received several years ago. Faust's appearance was similar to Eric's side drones, but only his hair was a bit longer. He had just a bit a tad shorter than Ridley. Whenever Ridley wasn't around, he commanded the Black Shadow organization with the Iron Fist, and he was known for sure to be just as ruthless as Ridley whenever they stood against him. Yes, that I could promise you well, Commander, Ridley assured Faust. But first, we must eliminate Kim Possible and her lover, Ron Stoppable. They will be a great threat to our plans, and we must eliminate their allies as well. True, Foss replied. And how, I may ask, how can we proceed with our plans? That's where the plutonium comes in, Ridley replied. It will help us in our plans to rid the world of Kim Possible and her prophetic allies. Global justice will also be another challenge once she and Ron Stoppable are out of the picture. It shouldn't be too difficult, Faust countered. Our organization has managed to infiltrate global justice and many other major government agencies. Once Kim Possible and her allies have been dealt with, our goal is to achieve their world domination within our grasp. Indeed, Ridley sneered. We'll finally crush the corruption of chaos within this world and once our plans are unfold. So when's the next stage to our plan, my lord? Faust asked. Ridley grinned evilly when he said that. Glad you will, if you, you asked. If you follow me to my quarters, I'll show you. Lead the way, Ridley, Lee, Faust nodded. Then he followed the Black Shadow organization leader out of the loading dock and into the main entrance of their HQ. Ridley was now eager to show his commander the sinister plans he had not just for Kim Possible, but for their allies as well. If there was one thing Ridley was good at, it was finding a person's weakness, then exploiting it to achieve his goals. While some of his past uh, advertiseries had been tough to dealt with, they eventually fell once they found out about their weakness. Ridley was not only defeated them, but he went as so far as to crush their spirits right before killing them. He had been secretly studying Kim Possible in secret with the help of his formers, and Ridley had to admit, Kim Possible wasn't really a weak and minded individual, and neither was Ron. However, Ridley had knew that every person had some sort of weakness, even Kim Possible and Ron Stoppable. He was no fool. Ridley had seen so much that they both cared for each other, and that even made them insparable. He even knew that if someone thing bad were to happen to one of them, the other world would be emotionally scarred for life, and that would probably be one of their weakness that Ridley could explode the easiest. Just you two wait, Ridley fought with an evil sneer. Our feelings are what bonds you together, and crushing that bond will be only a matter of time to truly break a person. You must crush their spirits, and that's what will lead them to their downfall. Ridley had so many thoughts on how he crushed all of Kim and Ron's hopes and dreams, and just the thought of seeing the two greatest heroes allowing despair over the loss of their families, friends, and allied lies filed Ridley with pure statistic joy, and that was just only to begin with. The horrors they had planned to the world were just getting started. Ron was then started awake by the sound of his communicator buzzing on the other side of the table. He looked over at the clock and picked up the communicator and saw that it was 9.45 a.m. Ron had assumed that Kim was the one calling him, but he turned it off and it was to be Wade instead. Hey Wade, what's going on? Ron asked curiously. There's a situation down in Lower 10 and, and G... 
EJ wants you to and Kim to investigate it, Wade replied. Oh boy, let me guess, Ron sighed. Villain's causing problems again? No, it's actually the opposite, Wade answered. There is a car bombing last night around three in the morning, and the police had found evidence where it really got global justice attention. Where did they find that? Ron asked, now at full attention. Not sure yet, Wade replied. I wasn't told what they found, only that you and Kim are needed there. Dang, Ron exclaimed. If global justice is involved, then that means this is not an ordinary car bombing. I'd better go down there with Kim right away. Hey, I've got her already notified about it. And she'll be right by to get you in the bit, Wade informed. All right, thanks for the heads up, Wade, Ron replied. No problem, Wade, Wade winked, then signed off. Ron then tapped Rufus in the small bed on the bedside of the table lamp, waking him up. Hey, buddy, we got a mission down at Lower Ten. You ready? Ron asked, slipping into his mission gear. Now fully awake, Rufus said, yeah. Once Ron was in his mission gear, Rufus then jumped inside Ron's sports jacket. And then the two of them headed out. Once they headed out, they found Kim waiting for them in her modified purple cope that near and near the driveway. Ron then rushed over to the passenger side and shut the door and asked Kim if she knew more details about this mysterious car bombing. Nope, only I know as much as you do, Kim replied. Whatever it is, though, it's got to be serious if global justice is involved. Yeah, Ron said as the car began moving. I have a feeling we're not going to like what we're going to find. Same here, Kim replied. As they headed down towards Lower Ten, Ron recalled the nightmare he had last night with Sensei, warning him about the future, and figured now would be a good time to tell him Kim about it. Speaking of which, I had this horrid nightmare of the night of us waking up in the fields that turned us into a bunch of brambles, and after they caught on fire and forced us to run... We heard someone laughing evilly before the flames reached to us. Then I woke up, Ron explained. Kim briefly glanced over at Ron with a concerned look and then said, That seems really creepy, but why are you telling me this, Ron? Well, because right after I woke up, Sensei appeared and looked like a ghost in my room and warned me that we'd face a huge threat not like any other. He also did say that both of us would face a bunch of trials and tribulations but also for me to stay in the light if all went wrong. And what's worse, Sensei say that his time is near the end with his other students drawing nearer, and it's really worrying me, KP, Ron answered. This got Kim really worried. Ron was never the one to lie about something this serious, but given the grave of his voice, it definitely sounded serious. That doesn't sound good, Kim said worriedly. It almost as feels as if Sensei was predicting something horrible doomsday event. That's what it feels like to me, Ron replied. The only great threat that we ever faced was the Lordian invasion. But I honestly don't know what kind of threat would be in greater than that. I can't figure it out honestly, and I've been thinking about it ever since Sensei warned me about it. Did he specifically say exactly what this threat was? Kim asked curiously. No, he vanished before I could ask him, Ron said with a frustrated tone. I honestly wish we could, he could have said exactly what we would have been facing. Then I'd be more prepared. Maybe since I didn't know exactly what this new fret was, Kim speculated. Sometimes visions of the future aren't really clear in detail. Yeah, that's possible, Ron agreed. My nightmare was similar to yours like that, but except I wasn't able to make up the figure burning in the field. I could also hear them cackling, and it sounded definitely like a man. I'm wondering if maybe my nightmare was just a vision the one sensei had. Also, there's something else I forgot. And what's that? Kim asked. Rufus seemed to have a nightmare as well, and when I asked him about what's the matter when he woke up, he did say that you around everyone else are dead. I tried asking him who these others were, but he just kept making these weird gestures and exploding sounds. Ron explained.